Uh, Matthew 16, I hope you've turned there already. I want to continue for just a brief moment this morning uh, in the series that we've been going through entitled Journey with Jesus. We're now into the, um, amazingly, into the 11th part uh, of this series that we began at the beginning of, of this year uh, that will continue up through the end of uh, next month, through the end of April, all the way through Resurrection Sunday, uh, in just a few Sundays thereafter. I've entitled this morning's message, uh, Jesus. Jesus founded his church. Uh, during Jesus' Galilean ministry, which we've had some moments to, to reflect upon, he took his disciples away on, on retreats. It would ask the question, why, why did Jesus take his disciples on various retreats? Why? I think one is pretty obvious, the same reason why you and I go on retreats sometimes. They just needed rest. Anybody ever get busy in life? You have a lot going on. We call them uh, not necessarily retreats today. Many times we may call them vacations. Uh, we, we just need a moment to get away and maybe just to enjoy a, a little bit of rest or, re or relaxation. Uh, but secondly, I believe Jesus took his disciples on retreats. Why? Because he had the desire to instruct them more thoroughly in order that they could carry on his work after he knew that a day was coming that he would soon leave, be ascended uh, to the right hand of his father again. Uh, one of these retreats, on one of these retreats in the area of Caesarea Philippi, uh, a quite, quite a few miles north of the Sea of Galilee where a vast majority of Jesus' ministry took place, uh, most believe not far uh, from the Mount Hermon, the possible site of the transfiguration, uh, which occurred just a few days after this passage that we're fixing to read here in just a moment. Uh, Jesus had been with his disciples for some time and he wanted to know how much that they've come to the understanding of who he is what he is what what he is about why he came uh, to the earth what he came uh, to accomplish so he begins to ask his disciples a question the, the first being a very general one which we'll read here in just a moment he probably wasn't so much as interested in knowing what the multitudes thought of him as he was probably interested in knowing what his disciples, his closest followers, uh, came to the revelation of who he was. And the first question paved the way for the more, uh, could we say, the more intimate second question, uh, which was to follow, which we're going to build this morning's uh, message upon. Now, Simon Peter was there. And, and Simon Peter, um, maybe like some of us, uh, he always had the answer. Anytime somebody asked a question, he was always the one that spoke up. You know, anybody know somebody like that? You could be in a gathering of three, you could be in a gathering of five, a gathering of 20, and there's always one person that has the answer, right or wrong. They always have the answer. You, you know that person this morning? That, that was Simon Peter. Didn't matter if Jesus asked a question, he, he thought he had it right. So, so he was going to give the answer. Uh, the interesting thing was this time he was right. Answered the question correctly. But why? Because he had received some great revelation uh, in the course of his life. Look here with me in Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. Pick up with me in the 13th verse. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples... Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven 
Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, a beautiful passage of scripture that you've given to us for revelation. Lord, help us to receive it with clarity. Lord, over these next few moments this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, three thoughts I want to give you this morning based on the revelation of this conversation that Jesus has with his disciples, specifically Peter. The first I bring to you this morning, I'll just classify as the foundation of the church. Peter hears these questions and he offers this thoughts. That you are Christ, the Son of the living God. Some would say, well, I, I would think that that would be a quite normal response. I hear these are disciples that have been with Jesus for a little while now. They, they probably have heard this over and over and over. But yet there might have been some confusion about the coming of Jesus. Who this gentleman was. When, when Peter makes the statement that you are Christ, the Son of the living, word, the living God, that, that word Christ simply means the Messiah or the Anointed One. That Simon Peter was recognizing who Jesus is, was, and will continue to be. This was big. They've had all the prophetic words in the law in the Old Testament concerning the coming of the Messiah. Yet many struggled with the revelation. They questioned, they debated. Just as we see the experience today, is, is Jesus really coming again? How will we know when Jesus is coming? How, how, how do we know that the Messiah is coming back again? People converse about it. They question. And hear me, when Jesus came the first time, there were some that didn't grasp it. Just as there will probably be some that won't grasp the second coming of the Messiah. Yet Simon Peter caught it. He said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. That you are the son of the living God. Mm. Beautiful words. And Jesus says that he would build his church, catch this, on the fact that he is the son of the living God. Look, look back into the scripture with me again. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, and son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Mm. It's an interesting statement. Some actually see this statement as a play on words because uh, in the Greek language there's two words for the word rock um, just as we have multiple words that represent that say the same thing that represent different things in the Greek language there's more than one word for rock some have suggested that when Jesus is talking here to Peter and refers to him as, as a rock, he is referring to him in the Greek translation as the movable type of rock. But yet that Jesus is the rock that will never change. That he is the rock that will never move. That he is, as the Bible would classify, as that solid rock. There may be a basis for such interpretation within this text. Others have felt that Jesus would build his church on Peter's confession, or better yet understood, on Peter's faith, and thereon on the faith of others, just like Peter, who would say that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He makes the statement, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now we're just laying the foundation, the foundation 
of the church this morning. Whatever shade of interpretation we give to the confession, one thing is certain, that the church of Jesus Christ is built upon the fact of his complete deity and his, and his equality with God the Father. Jesus was born, we recognize, of a virgin birth and possessed a unique nature. And although he identified himself with man, he was never the, nevertheless God in the flesh form. The church is built on this truth. Simply on Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Mm. Let me give you a thought this morning in relation to where the church is moving. You may want to write this one down. I believe unless the church believes in the deity of Jesus Christ, mm. it will seek to win the lost in vain. Unless the church believes in the deity of Jesus Christ, it will seek to win the lost in vain. Let that soak in on you for just a moment. Jesus is trying to gain an... Where are his disciples? The whole series is built on journey with Jesus, growing in the knowledge, the understanding of Jesus. Why? Because we want to become the disciples that, that we have purpose, that we were created to become. If so, we got to continue to grow in the revelation of who Jesus was. You understand that most people that walked the earth at the time of Jesus failed to see Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hear my heart this morning, but I'm wondering if the church or what is thought of as the church today is failing to recognize the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah, the anointed one. Because of so, our efforts to seek and to save the lost are often done in vain without the impact that is required. <clears throat> when a church falters on this one truth, believing in the deity of Jesus Christ, it's not long where the f before the church will start compromising in other areas of belief. Because it all begins there. That he's the rock. That he is Christ, the Son of God. Upon that rock, that he's the solid rock that the church will be built upon. And if I can't believe in who he is, then everything else of value, of importance, of belief in my life begins to waver. Look into our world today. There are many people, there are many people within what we would classify as the church that are struggling in the belief of who Jesus is, the deity of Jesus, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Because of so, look at what is happening. Compromise here. Compromise here. Mm. I believe every teacher has to hold firm to this foundational belief, revelation that the Apostle Peter received. Look, look at what Jesus says to him. Mm. Blessed are you, blessed are you, Simon. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. This isn't a man-made revelation. This is a revelation that I simply believe comes from fellowship with God. Communion with God. Time with God. Seeking after God. Searching after God. This was the experience of the early disciples that, that they wanted to know God. And it was through the revelation of God that they gained the, the understanding that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. And everything else on their life was built on that foundational principle that would, the church, the church 
would be built on that foundational principle. Let's look into the second thought of this, the nature of the church. That word church translated comes from a Greek word that literally means to be called out. Called out. Could I submit to you that I believe that this is the true nature of the church? Those who are, are called out. It is composed of those who have been called out of sin and the world and have become new people, a new creation in Christ Jesus. The church. It wasn't until the end of Acts that it was referred to as an assembly. Most often was referred to as the church. So it offers the question this morning, referring to the nature of the church, what, what is the church? Could I submit to you that I believe the church is what we would refer to as born-again believers? When the Bible makes reference to the church, it's making reference the, to those who have accepted Jesus, that have accepted the, salvi- the, the, the saving grace, the salvation of Jesus uh, within their lives. It, it's not referring to the, uh, uh, to the buildings. It's not referring to the tents. It's simply referring to those born-again believers. When, when Jesus spoke of his church in this passage, he was speaking, of, co- of course, in terms of the concept of, of who the church is, who the church will become. There there weren't any buildings, organizational structures that were put into place. It wasn't until later that they began to gather together and you have what we refer to as the church of Ephesus, uh, the church of Corinth, the church of Galatia, others that have been made mention of there in the biblical times. Mm. But the church was simply a visible form of bodies, believers, coming together to learn, to grow, to fellowship, to break bread with one another. Mm. Mm. The church is not made up of lost people, but people who were lost. Now the lost need to be invited and loved and embraced that they might become part of the church. You you know, if you study early church history, there was an interesting phenomenon that took place for somebody to be received into the life of the church. What we would classify as the membership of the church. They had to stand before the other believers and profess a belief in Jesus Christ. An outward an outward statement that says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. They took the actual words of Peter and they had to stand before others and literally declare that before they were accounted as part of the church of God. I pray that we not, we not slack and the expectations and the revelation of, of who the church is. Now I realize that, that there may be others that join in. Those that are curiosity, as we talked about with Nicodemus last week, he, he recognized that there is something different about Jesus. People recognize that, that at times there's something different about, about those that gather that call themselves the church. There may be some unusual things that take place or, or distinct characteristics of those who are, are part of the church and uh, mostly out of curiosity, others want to just come and see. Maybe for the hope of an experience that you and I have possibly had. That's okay. That's good. That's right. Yet they wouldn't be classified as part of the church. Because simply they haven't made a profession of faith. Of who Jesus Christ is. Mm. Can I tell you, the church is not a club. It's not a social gathering. Simply, as I identified, the church are those who have been called out. Another translation would say those who have been set apart. 
may be in the world, the Bible says, but not of the world. Not participators in the things of the world. Why? Because we've been called out of the life of sin. We've been called out of the, the things of the world into now a, a new believer, a new creation that we refer to now as the church of the living God. The nature, the nature of the church. You know, sometimes when people refer to the church, they refer to Cornerstone Church. But often when times when people refer to the church, they refer to the church in general. Um, I like a better word, I think a better word, the kingdom of God. Uh, as likened unto the church. The kingdom of God, those, those who we realize are believers in Jesus Christ. Who have accepted Jesus as the son of the living God. But I don't want to get caught up in the terminology this morning. I'm just giving you the nature of the church. Simply are those whose sins have been forgiven. Washed in the blood of Jesus. Let me get you to the third thought this morning. The promise to the church. And this is a beautiful statement in this passage. Look back to it with me for just a moment. Pick up with me in the 18th verse. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And catch the very next statement. And the gates of Hades, which often is translated hell, will not overcome it. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. What, what is it? This is a promise to the church. A statement of great assurance that Jesus gives. Mm. That the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Many, many have seen this passage as a promise that, of Jesus that the church will never go out of existence. It will remain until his second coming. This may be what Jesus meant. But I, I believe that there's another possible translation that's a better translation. When the church goes on the offensive, the forces of hell will not be able to withstand the onslaughts of the Christian people bonded together in what we would refer to as a militant action. In other words, I don't believe the church is called to be on the defense. I believe the church is called to be on the offensive. We're not called just to sit back and to receive the impacts of the enemy in our lives, but we're called to go out and make something happen. We're called to, to go and be doers of the word. The Bible says that, that my faith has to, has to spring into action into our lives. Going, going and, and taking hold of that which God has already promised into our lives. Uh, many of you know that we received a, took in a little dog almost a month ago now, I think. And, and last week we received in a new little dog. So we have one that's going to grow big and one that's going to stay little. They're pretty interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. To watch them attack each other is amazing. Usually, it's not what you would think. Usually the little one is going after the big one. Or who will become the big one is already the big one. But I had an abnormal experience Friday evening. They're young, so... As of now, they don't run away. So it was a beautiful day. I had the front door and back door opened up. And the dogs were just running in and out, front to back, chasing one another. At this moment, the, little, the big one is chasing the little one. And we have steps in our house, stairs, up to the second floor that go up, I'm going to say, like five steps. And then they turn and go up some more. And then they split and go two different ways. Well, the little dog was on the corner of the, the second step kind of hidden because there's a piano that sets right next to it because he knew that Jackson had gone out the front door was eventually going to come back in. So he's sitting right here and I'm just watching this. And all of a sudden Jackson comes flying by and Ryder just leaps off both steps, flying through the air and jumps on top of Jackson. They go rolling over top of each other and he just like, going after each other craziest thing I'm thinking wow he's a little bit he got some fortitude he's willing to try this 
And, and I thought, why doesn't the church jump out there and say, we're going to go attack the enemy? We're going to go do what God has called us to do. Because we have the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We know that if we go out, that there be moments of, 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 that we have to, as I realized this morning in broad revelation, that we'll have to deal with the bees. Yet the bees won't overcome us. Why? Because the gates of hell would not prevail against us. That, that we can band together as brothers and sisters and go out to, to do what? To be the disciples of Jesus. To go and to win the lost. To go and to pray for the hurting. To go in and to help those who are, are caught in the lies of the enemy and bring them to a place of hope and revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm. I look at the names of the cross this morning, church. Mm. Some of these are your names that you've put up here. Chris, Shane, Jason, John, Josh, Jose, Emmanuel, Becky, Allison, the list, just hundreds of names all over the cross. And as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we we're called to go and to seek and to save the lost. To go and to embrace them and love them. And to stand with one another, to stand with them. Wanting to help them as a church that we could stand together. Because we know that there's vials, attacks of the enemy. Yet the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. A, a, a beautiful promise that Jesus gives. Why? Because we're standing upon the solid rock, upon Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> So let me begin to draw this to a conclusion for us this morning. Are you a part of the church? Hear me I'm not asking, do you attend a church? Because that attending a church doesn't make you a part of the church. Have you accepted Jesus and had a transformational experience in your life? That's the church. Some people go on searches for the right church. What I think many people are looking for is the perfect church. That may not happen until you get to heaven. We may be striving for that. But I believe standing before you and seated in front of me are imperfect people. That are only cleansed because of the love of Jesus and the blood of Jesus into our lives. But I believe many times we limit what we can become because we never really become part of the church where there's strength, help, teaching, embracing within the church. <clears throat> Hear my heart this morning, but I believe a lot of people go to a church until they have those moments of struggle and some people don't want to work through the struggles, so they go on to something else, just like in a lot of relationships today. They go to that place of struggle, and they feel like they've got to leave that relationship. I believe it's in those moments of struggle when you grow the most, when the church grows the most. Battling with one another, standing with one another, serving, 
serving one another, experiencing life together. And the reality that I give to you this morning is God has called us to be a part of a church. When I say a church, I believe that God has called us to simply, I'm going to break this down, to simply be a part of a local body of believers. Not just a church in the general sense. I think that's where a lot of people are wanting to drift to, but there's no belonging there. There's no fellowship there. It's really just trying to do this life by ourselves. God, God has called us to stand arm in arm, hand in hand, and, and to, to begin to march against the forces of evil and begin to take back, just as the children of Israel did, what the enemy has tried to stole from us, to bring lives, to bring souls back into the kingdom of God that, that have been deceived, corrupted through the works of the enemy, just as you and I were into somebody grabbed our hand and then brought us into the kingdom of God also to carry on the mission of Jesus that's what this retreat was all about with the disciples rest and so they could begin to understand more so what Jesus is and what he was about and I believe God is desiring that we would grow in the exact same revelation So if he would walk into your home today and he would ask you, who am I? Would you answer, well, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're Jeremiah. Some say this. No, 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 no. Who do you say that I am? He's simply saying to his disciples, I don't care who they say that I am. I'm, I'm dealing with you right now. Who do you say that I am? Peter speaks up and says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah. So I ask you, who do you say that he is? Because that makes a world of difference in how you live. Do you hear me? That makes a world of difference in what kind of disciple that you will become and who you profess that Jesus is. That will actually determine your involvement within the local body. Who do you profess that Jesus is? Could you say, as Peter did, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God?